Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Hello to everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, organized by Ashri Saudi Arabia chapter. Uh, today's webinar will talk about an overview of critical environments and air quality monitoring. Our webinar agenda will be, we'll talk about code physics of ASHRAE. We'll give an introduction about ASHRAE, introduction about CETRA, today's presenters, and today's presentation, at, at the end, we will start our presentation. ASHRAE Code of Ethics, in this and all other ASHRAE meetings, we will act with honesty, fairness, courtesy, competence, inclusiveness, and respect, respect for others, which simplify our core values of excellence, commitment, integrity, collaboration, volunteerism, and diversity, and shall avoid all real and perceived conflicts of interest. ASHRAE, founded in 1894, is a global society advancing human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. The society and its members focus on building systems, energy efficiency, indoor air quality, refrigeration, and sustainability within the industry. Through research, standards writing, publishing, and continuing education, ASHRAE shapes tomorrow's built environment today. ASHRAE is celebrating 125 years of shaping the built environment. Become a member of ASHRAE by visiting ashrae.org slash join. About CETRA, CETRA founded in 1967, CETRA system designs and develops the most comprehensive product lines of pressure sensing sense reducers in the world. CETRA is part of the Fortive group of companies with its headquarters in the USA. Today's presenters, Bruce Knudsen, product manager, CETRA systems, about him. Bruce is the CETRA product manager for critical environments with an emphasis in healthcare. He brings strong knowledge of healthcare applications and extensive technical experience in product development and mechanical engineering. Rabia Mansour is Middle East Regional Director, CETRA Systems. Rabia is a CETRA Regional Sales Director for Middle East and Africa. Ashley, Saudi Arabia chapter in collaboration with the CETRA Systems USA brings to you this uh, presentation and uh, Bruce will talk more about it. Thank you for attending and uh, presentation will be now with Mr. Bruce and Mr. Rabia. Well, thank you for the introduction, Osama, and uh, a very quick thank you to all the attendees tonight, and a quick shout out and thank you as well for the ASHRAE team, Mohammed Abdul Rahim, Alia, and Osama Azam for the tremendous effort in putting all of this together and to bringing uh, valuable information, hopefully, to the attendees, um, keeping all the ASHRAE members well informed so thanks again and with that we we get into our webinar for the night which is a an overview of critical environments and air quality uh, as osama mentioned this will be presented mainly uh, through my colleague bruce bryce knudsen uh, joining us from the us from our headquarters in the usa a quick um overview and introduction about Citra Systems. We can go to the next slide, please. So Citra was established in 1967 by two MIT professors who were working on identifying the solution for reliably measuring the very low differential pressure with very high accuracy and very high repeatability. And with that, from the labs of MIT came the product the capacitive sensing element that is the foundation of Citra's product portfolio as of today. Uh, Citra, as Osama mentioned, is part of Fortive Corporation, a uh, multinational with multi-disciplines and companies working on the healthcare, working on 
uh, oscilloscopes, working on enabling solutions to, to our customers worldwide. Uh, generally, Cetra, with its overall solutions, uh, are found in, in HVAC applications with niche applications from NASA all the way to your to the mall next door. So uh, we do have a, a big um, installed base and we try to offer solutions to customers' problems. Uh, the majority of our products uh, are manufactured in the U.S. with the picture here showing the headquarter in Massachusetts in a town called Boxborough. And with that, I'll be handing over to my colleague Bryce to dig deeper into the technicalities of today. Bryce? All right, thank you, Rabia. <clears throat> um, I'll just throw my webcam on real quick. I think sometimes it's nice to put a face with the name. Um, so I'm Bryce Newton, and I'm the product manager here at Cetra Systems for Healthcare and Critical Environments. Uh, I'm gonna throw that off just so we can see our presentation better as well, but I thought it'd be good to do that. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, especially at nine o'clock in the evening. So I know that uh, maybe this isn't always the most perfect time, but uh, we're really excited to have everybody here for this presentation. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to talk just kind of high level what we're talking about when we refer to critical environments, make sure that we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about the standard codes and accreditations associated with these spaces, clean room classifications, uh, and other healthcare classifications related to ASHRAE, understanding positive and negative pressure rooms. So we'll go through a number of applications and examples, and then we'll do a Q&A. And throughout this presentation, we will have some polls, so we really ask that you participate in those. Uh, it helps us better understand what else we should provide in the future for education um, and, and products, for that matter, at the end of the day. Uh, I know the views and opinions expressed here or implied don't represent ASHRAE, ISO, or USP. I just want to be clear about that. Um, you know, obviously, we're going to talk a lot about the ASHRAE 170 standard. And a lot of this is based on that, but, but we don't, you know, represent them. All right, so what are critical environments? Um, so in the healthcare and life sciences space, we usually think of these as very high consequence applications where either safety or money, large amounts of money usually are on the line. Uh, it's important to maintain proper HVAC airflow, room pressure, humidity, particle counts, these are usually life safety concerns in almost every instance when we talk about critical environments. And then usually this customer environment is regulated by either codes and standards, sometimes government, sometimes other. And a high value is always placed on reliability, accuracy, and quality, mostly because of the first three uh, themes in this market. So let's just talk about the examples a little bit better. So in healthcare, we'll be referring and talking mostly to things like isolation rooms, operating rooms, surgery centers, compounding pharmacies, sterile prep areas. The list, honestly, in healthcare is pretty long. Um, if you're, you know, in hospitals, there are a lot of critical spaces that both do multiple things, right? They keep contaminants out to protect either a person or a product or they keep contaminants in to protect everybody else in the hospital in the case of infectious disease. Uh, compounding pharmacies are an interesting one because they actually kind of span the life sciences healthcare gap to some extent, because compounding pharmacies land in the pharmaceutical space and there's usually a clean room involved uh, and they usually have pretty stringent requirements by USP and ISO. Uh, laboratories, uh, this can be a wide range, everything from a basic laboratory to up to a BSL-3 or 4 lab containing, you know, infectious disease like tuberculosis. And then vivariums, animal holding spaces, it's always important to make sure that those are properly managed. And then the last two here, you know, they just kind of reiterate some of the previous ones in the life science that we already talked about. And then COVID-19 response is kind of the one that has been obviously the hot topic for the last few years. We have things like mobile hospitals where how you manage pressure relationships and what kind of products you can use to even do that is, is still evolving. Uh, additionally, patient room conversion. So this goes back to healthcare, but it's kind of a unique one because generally we don't like to convert a room from positive to negative or neutral to the other, uh, especially not on the fly. 
Additionally, long-term care services and uh, other you know, medical offices have become a bigger focus during the COVID-19 response. All right. Well, now that we have touched base on what we think of and what we're talking about, we talk about critical environments. We have a question. How familiar are you with environment monitoring regulations for hospital and life science facilities? Not at all, somewhat, or very. There should be a poll in the upper right panel for you. If you'd please respond to that, we'll just give you a minute to do that. All right. Abe, are we good on the poll? I've shared the results. I can't quite see it, so. You guys can see the poll, actually? Yeah. So it's there, and the results are there. The 64% right. is uh, somewhat, and we do have 17% uh, with no uh, familiarity at all. 20% uh, almost, uh, 19 to be exact, have very uh, excellent knowledge Thank when it comes to critical environments. For some reason, I can't see that in my screen. Um, all right, Abi, can you close that down oh, for us? Thank you. Well, that's not you showing the right screen, is it? Presentation. Yep. Oh, I lost control there. No problem. Now, now your screen is showing. Okay. All right. So let's talk through design standards a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk high level, and then we'll talk about some of the details. Common design standards and guidelines for healthcare and life sciences are generally fall under the four groups here. ASHRAE Standard 170, Ventilation of Healthcare Facilities. My guess is everyone here recognizes the beginning letters here because this is an ASHI document. USP 795, 797, and 800, which cover pharmaceutical compounding. We won't talk about 795 much because it's generally non-critical compounding. So the requirements on it are pretty minimal. This would be something like your local pharmacy that you go down to to get you know, your medication. 797 and 800 are a lot more stringent. This is actual true pharmaceutical compounding for sterile products. ISO 14644 is the primary clean room standard. So this defines how you get classified as a clean room, what the requirements are for that space, what kind of environmental conditions you have to maintain, recommendations on how to do that. And then lastly here we have GMP and CGMP. Uh, we've identified obviously the EU standard because that's usually what's used in um, or referenced in MEA in absence of another standard. Uh, and this is the manufacturer of sterile medicinal products. Now, technically GMP and CGMP can refer to a number of other things as well. Uh, there's a num many, many categories in this space. We won't dig too far into the GMP and CGMP space uh, because it doesn't necessarily touch as heavily uh, on the environmental piece as it as much as it actually just talks about documenting and proving that you have managed it. Accreditation, licensing, and certification. Uh, Joint Commission International and Subahi are the two primary ones for accreditation in the Saudi uh, health system. And then obviously for any clean room spaces, there are ISO certifications. And for any kind of manufacturing of drugs or uh, then you have to have GMP certification through the Saudi Food and Drug Authority. All right. So that's kind of high level of the major documents that we'll talk about. Um, these are basically what will feed the, the data in the following slides. So this slide is primarily a hospital-based slide. This is all of the primary spaces that we think of as highly critical in a hospital. This includes operating theaters and airborne infection isolation, protective environments, uh, the compounding pharmacy, both hazardous and non-hazardous. Those are defined 
by both ASHRAE and then it references USB 797 and 800. Additionally, Central Sterile and Central Sterile 30 and Decon. So this, in this case, almost all of these spaces have to have a minimum differential pressure of 2.5 pascals, whether it's positive or negative, um, is there in the left column. Obviously, in environments like operating theaters and protective environments, our goal is to con keep contaminants out. So in those cases, we're going to have positive pressurization to the adjacent spaces. And in these cases, it is required that you have constant pressure monitoring locally to those spaces so that people in the area and so that your building automation system knows that they are properly pressurized. Um, on the right here, we also have the standards for temperature, humidity, and air changes per hour. Um, in ASHRAE, the one here that they care about the most is usually the air changes per hour. You can note that operator theaters is 20 air changes per hour, making sure that that air is turning quickly and we're not maintaining contaminated air in the space while they're operating. Um, additionally, there sometimes there are other spaces listed here, but uh, these are the ones that we believe are the most critical to maintain and the ones that Joint Commission usually spends the most time assessing. At the bottom here, we have Central Sterile. Um, they do not require a constant pressure monitor, but it is best practice and it is common to see people do this because it maintains that your sterile products stay sterile and that your sterile products that have been used are not contaminating your sterile space or contaminating the rest of your hospital. Along with these major critical spaces, there's what we call, we call these non-critical spaces because they are not identified officially as critical spaces in ASHRAE, but they are identified as requiring certain differential pressures, having a positive or negative differential with the space adjacent. They have temperature and air change requirements, as you can see here, but they're often not monitored. We do believe there's a best practice here in monitoring these spaces because they are all over the hospital. For example, your dirty linen and clean linen storage, every floor of your hospital has at least one of these spaces. That means you have clean linen that could be getting contaminated or you have dirty linen that's contaminating the rest of your hospital. So it, even though they don't specify a specific differential here, these rooms do get inspected often by the Joint Commission to verify that they are at least the positive or negative that they're supposed to be. All right, so we have another poll question here. Um, in your opinion, a healthcare facility should also continuously monitor key parameters on the non-critical spaces. I kind of led you on that one, but we really are actually looking for your opinion, not ours. Abe, do we have a poll? Yeah, it's like. Right. I don't know why I can't pull up the poll. can't see that on your screen also no i can't see the poll at all strange and we have a result so 68 percent say yes and 21 percent say no 11 percent can't say okay all right, great. I uh, probably skewed that result a little bit, but we, we definitely agree with that, that assessment. All right. All right, let's move on and we can talk about clean rooms, which basically cover the remainder of the you know, life science space, um, the pharmaceutical space. So Usually those are governed primarily by ISO 14644 from a condition perspective. Uh, they are also governed by the GMP standards that we talked about before, but generally those don't always define specific temperatures, pressures. Those are left up to the facility to define usually, but you have to show that you are meeting the requirements. The primary thing with the ISOs 14644 is the particle count and air changes per hour. 
In this case, our air changes are what are extremely high because that's how you make sure that any particulates that do show up in this space are removed, and the velocity comes along with that. Um, you can see here obviously that an ISO class one room has basically no particulate matter, whereas like an ISO eight or ISO nine, which honestly could be pretty close to what we see on a daily basis, um, is very high with you know over 35 million particles in this like larger size. Um, we do you do see in, you know, in pharmaceutical manufacturing, class 1000 is a pretty very common ISO seven or six. Uh, the uh, compounding pharmacies often require a class five hood in many cases, and compounding pharmacy requirements usually fall under something along the ISO 7 range, depending upon the specific application. All right, um, just a short list of kind of other environmental requirements and clean room applications. So obviously, healthcare and life science aren't the only ones. We have semiconductor and optical manufacturing. There's general industrial. Um, and then, you know, independent compounding pharmacies, as I mentioned, ISO 5 hoods with ISO 7 clean room um, requirements on that space. This is actually very, um, USP 797 and 800 defined this compounding pharmacy requirement. And it actually has a lot of conditional statements that we're not going to cover here. But that is something to be aware of that the requirements on the ISO class are dependent often on the adjacent space ISO class as well, or if you have a hood or not. For example, if you have no hood, you have to have an ISO 5 space. All right, All right. let's talk through a few examples. Um, so if we have clean room manufacturing or like an, an isolation room, one here being clean room manufacturing where you want to keep contaminants out, this also applies to something like a protective environment for a cancer ward in a hospital, or if you have a negative pressure room, negative 2.5 pascals, um, then is the minimum requirement, but usually these are kept around 5 to 10. This would actually be one where we're trying to keep a contaminant in, like we said, infectious disease. So a good example of an airborne infection isolation room with the types of equipment that would be installed, you'd obviously have an inlet and an outlet, um, sorry, a supply and an exhaust uh, with a differential between the, the airflow there, right? You can see there's 700 on the right on the supply and then 800 on the exhaust creating a negative space. Um, in this case, it is pretty standard to have a room pressure monitor on the outside of the wall that's required in ASHRAE. Um, it is not necessarily required if this was like a standard clean room application, but you would need to have a differential pressure sensor somewhere reporting to some tool um, to define that it's negative. Uh, humidity and temperature readings, usually taken off of a room uh, temperature and humidity monitor. Those, by the way, you know, can often be presented on a room pressure monitor outside the room as well. And then you can see here, um, well, we're just indicating the, the airflow velocity here. So that would be a tool like an air wand or an airflow meter that you can put in either the exhaust or the supply duct to verify the air changes per hour. Usually in a negative space, you're gonna put that in the exhaust duct. All right, operating theater. Kind of the opposite of a isolation room, right? So this would be positive where we wanna keep everything out but you're also gonna have multiple spaces where you're trying to keep a differential pressure, usually to a scrub room on one side, to a main hallway on the other. Um, it is extremely common to have a room pressure monitor at the outside or sometimes on the inside that displays all of the conditions of that room. Everything from differential pressure, airflow, temperature and humidity, and in some cases, particle size. So that leads us to our next poll. Uh, do you recommend or use particle counters to monitor air quality in operating theaters? And we have the poll page up.
giving it a couple of more seconds. And the results are in. So 68% say yes, uh, it's recommended. 6% uh, no, 19% expect it in the future, and 6% are not aware. Awesome. All right. I'll actually say that, you know, in the US, we see a much lower percentage of particle counter use, but we do see that trend shifting more towards the direction that you have in, in Saudi. All right. Um, so another application, compounding pharmacies. So it's a little bit more complicated space. Um, in this case, this is a hazardous uh, compounding pharmacy with a sterile production space, a hazardous storage space, and an anteroom. Uh, in this case, there's going to be particle counters in the sterile production, temp and humidity in all the spaces, even though we're not showing it here in the anteroom, it's often, uh, they're often maintained there as well. And in this case, we've placed this room pressure monitor sort of inside the anteroom to show the, and in this case, this monitor is probably monitoring all of the conditions here that are shown. So you can actually, it's a single view of all of the spaces here. But in some cases, you may have a monitor on each space individually. Um, or use monitor could be here outside the room. Now, when you do all of these spaces, this anteroom is going to be positive to the outside, but these sterile production to anteroom and hazardous storage to production are going to be negative to the anteroom to make sure that that hazardous space stays in, inside. All right. Oh, I forgot that that was our last um, application. Um, I believe. Rabia, you usually talk a little bit about some of our customers. Sure. So uh, we do have, um, we came across a lot of those applications across the region, and we have been involved with many of our customers and many healthcare facilities across the region in Saudi, across Saudi Arabia, and across the GCC and North Africa in trying to supply and help our customers meet the uh, the standards and comply with regulations, both national regulations and international regulations. Uh, we have worked with both private sectors as well as public sector hospitals, just with some um, mentioned references here, like King Faisal Specialist Hospital, uh, a lot of the medical cities in Saudi Arabia, as well as university hospitals and educational hospitals with many uh, private hospital chains across the region as well, um, uh, preferring us as a solution provider for their critical environments. Uh, hopefully, we will continue to serve our customers in the region and to be involved with their journey in solving problems and achieve you and have a great evening.